Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Perez Art Museum Miami. My name is Adrian Chadwick, and I'm the Deputy Director for Education here at PAM. Thank you for joining us tonight for our Juneteenth film screening, which is a two-day affair that will take place here at PAM and also at Little Haiti Cultural Center tomorrow. Um, thank you so much to the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture for contacting us more than 18 months ago to uh, put on this event. Um, thank you to John Goff and also to Michelle Mater, who will introduce our speakers today, and also to our PAM education team and AV team who have helped us put this event together. Anita, Oscar, Dan, Denise. Um, so yeah, so we decided to do a joint intro yeah. and Michelle, um, I'm gonna introduce Michelle and then Michelle will introduce our, our panel today. Um, we're gonna then show the films, the two films, and uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end. So Michelle Mater, guest curator for Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, is the founder, host, and producer of the critically acclaimed, creatively speaking, film series. Creatively Speaking has been a premier forum for presenting works by and about women and people of color for 22 years. Ms. Mater's professional background spans more than 30 years experience as a film producer, writer, arts administrator, distribution and marketing specialist, film programmer, and college professor. In February 2015, Creatively Speaking co-presented the unprecedented film series Tell It Like It Is, Black Independence in New York City, 1968 to 1986, with the Film Society of Lincoln Center, which was awarded the Film Heritage Award by the National Society of Film Critics. This year, another program she's co-curated with BAM Cinematheque staff, One Way or Another Black Women Filmmakers, 1970 to 1991, received two amazing acknowledgments in the same month. Uh, first, one way or another, black received two amazing acknowledgments in the same month. First, <laughs> first, Richard Brody, the New Yorker magazine, listed the program as the best repertory series in 2017, in his best movies of 2017, end of year publication. In addition, the National Society of Film Critics honored us again with the Film Heritage Award of 2017 for this new program. Matera continues to hold positions as Associate Professor of Media Studies and Film at the New School, where she began teaching in 2001, and is also currently Director of the Bachelor's Program for Adults and Transfer Students. Ms. Matera is currently a member of the Board of Directors of Women Make Movies and a former member of the Board of New York Women, Film and Television, Women in Film and Television. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Matera. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adrian, and um, so thrilled to be here. Um, as Adrian said, it's been something we've been working on for quite a while now. John Goff and Ria and I, um, so thrilled that we're actually here, and you have a really special program in store for you. We have two of the filmmakers here with us this evening, both filmmakers, Stephanie Black, who is uh, the director of H2 Worker, and Stephanie is a documentary filmmaker whose credits include the award-winning feature Life and Debt, which was on the impact of international organizations such as the IMF, the World Bank, and current globalization policies, and what those policies have had an impact upon developing nations such as Jamaica. In H2 Worker, which is the film you're gonna see tonight, which was made in 1990, the film is about the 10,000 Caribbean men who were brought to Florida each year to harvest sugarcane for American corporations under a temporary H2 status. And you'll see in the film what that really means. And we'll talk more during the Q&A about what the current status is of those workers. Um, Stephanie also made a film called uh, Being Bobby Brown in 2005, making a chant down Babylon with Lauren Hill. Her, uh, her credits go on and on, and we're really good friends and colleagues from New York, so we're really thrilled to have Stephanie with us tonight. Wave, Stephanie, where you are. She's way back there in the back. 
And Jason Fitzroy Jeffers is the producer of the short film we're going to see this evening, Papa Machette, which was made in 2015. Je Jason is a writer, musician, and filmmaker from Barbados. We have a really funny story about how we met, um, who is based in Miami. <laughs> Since 2001, Jason has written about everything from crime and politics to arts and entertainment for many of South Florida's major publications, including the Miami Herald and Ocean Drive. In 2013, he assembled a crew of filmmakers to travel to Haiti to document the few remaining practitioners of the esoteric revolutionary martial art of Haitian machete fencing. This self-produced short film has, been met, has met with an outpouring of major press coverage from the likes of the Gawker, the Associated Press, and others. In 2015, 2014, Jason and his team mounted a successful Kickstarter program campaign where they raised the money to build enough for a house for the character you're going to see in the film, the, the, the subject of the film, Alfred Avril, the Haitian farmer and fencing master. Uh, his tiny house was damaged in the 2010 earthquake, and Jason and his team helped to rebuild it. Jason's work in all these fields, fields is conducted through the Caribbean Artist Collective Third Horizon, which he founded to recognize the work of avant-garde Caribbean filmmakers, musicians, writers, and artists who challenge the popular, popular notions of what Caribbean creativity encompasses. So we're really thrilled to have Jason with us tonight. And Jason and Stephanie will be joined by Rhea Combs from the Smithsonian Museum in DC, as well as Joanne Hippolyte, who's the director, uh, who was the former director of the History Museum of Miami, and is also curator at the National Museum for African American History and Culture. So you'll be seeing all of them afterwards, so don't go away. Thank you and enjoy. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Rhea Combs. I am a curator of photography and film, as well as the director of the Earl W. and Amanda Stafford Center for African American Media Arts at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And on behalf of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, it is my distinct pleasure to be here and partner partnering with the Perez Art Museum Miami for this Juneteenth program. And I'm even more thrilled to be able to share this stage and moderate a conversation with these tremendously talented filmmakers and scholars. With me, I have Jeffers, Jason, um, excuse me, sorry, Jason, uh, Stephanie, Stephanie Black, and then my colleague, uh, jo Joanne Hippolyte, uh, who is also a curator and has a background in anthropology. So we're gonna have a variety of com uh, a sort of engaged conversation to really talk about sort of the film and then um, and sort of the connections that it has with some of the contemporary issues uh, today. And then we'll take a few questions from the audience. Uh, I'd like to start, Stephanie, with a question by also recognizing the fact that the Marley family is here with us, or some family members of the Marley family are here with us. So I'm going to start the first question off by um, asking you about the choice of the song at the end. Uh, the song, Redemption Song, um, is sort of feels like it could have had a bit of irony attached to it. So I'd like for you to sort of speak to that choice. Well, it's funny, at Q&As, you usually get a lot of the same questions. I never had that question before. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all for coming. Um, it's, I just want to say one thing. It's, um, the film is made in 1990, and we didn't have many opportunities to show it in Florida for the obvious reasons. And um, so I want to thank the Smithsonian and the Perez Art Museum of Miami for um, finally giving the film a screening in Florida. And I would just also say the film was on national television. It was on PBS when it had its broadcast in every state. It was on national broadcast on PBS. And the only um, city that it wasn't aired on was West Palm Beach. That, and they actually at the same time aired a documentary, a 30-minute documentary that they made on the sugar industry that did not have any king cutters in it at all and just spoke about the merits of sugar for one's health and 
the economy and such. So, okay, that is, uh, um, so it was, no, that was very interesting to me yeah. that, that the sugar industry even had that much power over um, PBS in this country, that they could influence the programming. Um, redemption song. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to say I think it speaks for itself. I really do. I felt it very strongly. And I had a, a little emotional moment because um, my my good sister, Sadella Molly, and my godson are here. And it's the first time I ever saw the film with them. And it really moved me to um, to to to, see, to hear and see the song over that image. So um, yeah, I think it speaks for itself. Well, yeah, it was it was a question again. It was more like you know, sort of, is this one of these? When you look at the faces of the of the men, and you have heard the sort of the the letters from their loved ones that they're writing, and the hope, and um, or even uh, you know, some of the challenges and heartfelt conversations that they are are having with you. I guess the question would then become sort of choosing that song and thinking through sort of the history and a lot of the sort of challenges that are faced uh, with respect to this this hard work and this labor how did you how did you end up having access to you know sort of getting into these barracks or the community as they called it so the film was made totally clandestinely. We didn't have permission at all to film inside the barracks. Um, we, we had to sneak in, and there were three of us. And um, the film, the film, um, the season goes from September to March, uh, and so the film is structured chronologically. And it was shot over the course of two seasons, and so we would film until we would come and film, and then they would be alerted, the police would start chasing us all the time. And so actually what I used to do is drive from Belglade back to Value Rent-A-Car at West Palm Beach, which is like an hour and a half, two hour drive um, every other morning so that we would have a different car with a different license plate. And the cane cutters thought this was quite amusing that I was always showing up with a different color car. <laughs> and. Um, but that, it was like a cat and mouse game, but I was young then and I thought it was amusing. And, um, but basically the sugar industry controls the police in that area and, then, and, and they work very hard not to, I did go to the sugar industry first to ask them if they, to give me permission to do the documentary and they said no. And then I met um, the woman, Rose, who you see who sells to the men. I, I met her, I was walking in Belglade trying to, figure out how to do this. And she came up to me and she asked me if I was a Peace Corps worker and I said no. And then I told her actually what I was doing, which is interesting, like some people you tell what you're doing and some people you don't. And I actually told her I'm trying to make a documentary about the king cutters here. And she said, do you have a car? And I said, yeah. And she said, great, because her car was broken and she needed a car to go selling. And so for the next two weeks, I just went selling with her. And it was great because she knew camps that I didn't know about. And she knew which nights to go because she was also sneaking on the camps to sell. And I apprenticed from her. And then the crew would come. And then we'd sneak in for a few films, sneak in. And then the police would be chasing us. And then changing the car didn't work. And so then, um, but the thing is with trespassing, you have to get arrested on the spot like they can't arrest you down the road. So that's what we, we learned. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, I wanted to ask you a question in terms of, it's interesting, the machete is used in different ways with these both of these films. And you chose to do it in more of an artistic practice, which then immediately made me think about even with some of the movements of Capoeira. And so I wanted to ask you sort of how you sort of came to this project and idea and even selected the subject that you worked through? Well, I'm originally from Barbados and um, you know, the machete, we call it a cutlass at home or, or a Collins. Collins from was... Detroit, so no, I not <laughs> So, so it's, it's, you know, it's this thing that you have around the house, you know, like everybody has one or two or three or five or 10, <laughs> right? Um, and I mean everybody, it just, it, it's a tool, it's, it can be a means of defense if so needed. Um, but I, I think I've always had this 
sense that there's a, a power and a symbolism to the machete. I'm a, I also am a writer and a musician, and the, the, the machete as totem is something that I've explored in my work prior to this. And when I found out about this martial art, my first inclination was not to make a film, um, but really just to go to Haiti and learn this martial art. And the film grew out of that. And uh, I think, you know, what really struck me was this desire to, in this particular instance, it was a tool that was used in servitude that was repurposed to become an instrument of change, of freedom. And, and I think that for me at least, the reason why I've been so drawn to that is I think there's so many systems that we still have to overthrow, have to overcome, have to figure our, our, our way out of. And I think that there's a certain kind of thinking, a certain kind of creative thinking that we have to unlock in ourselves if we're going to get past these systems of, of, of power and dominance. Um, I mean, thinking about it a lot in particular today because yesterday was the um, 38th anniversary of the assassination of uh, Walter Rodney, the Guyanese scholar. And, um, and, and so your relationship with that is what, the in, in the sense of sort of post-colonial theory and thinking through the ways in which you take these tools of right. entrapment and then you usurp them for exactly. reasons. A tools for resistance. Exactly. And so yeah. in, in making this film, th these are some of the sort of inspirations that were... Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's really what guided it, you know, wanting to try to reposition it in the popular imagination, you know. But then also just, you know, just tell Professor Avril's story. He was very much of the thinking that uh, this martial art was slipping away. Uh, I mean, there's still very many people who practice it there, but they, they don't want it to be shown. But he was of the belief that if this was not shown and shared, that the importance of this martial art and, and, and how it was used uh, would just disappear, you know? That's one of the things I thought was interesting with both films is that in different ways, they're sort of exposing secret societies, if you will, you know, sort of the H2 worker um, as this sort of, and even the, your approach was a clandestine sort of filmmaking process, which was sort of a secret kind of way of trying to expose this. And then this is Averill, Professor Averill, making this secret society and secret practice something that he felt was important to share with others. I would like to ask you, Joanne, like, you know, are there any sort of other sort of parallels or connections, Caribbean uh, or stateside, that you think that you know we can draw from this? And looking at sort of cultural expressions that might I made the sort of relationship between capoeira and this this martial art dance move. But are there other relationships that you could see either drawn with uh, slavery, sharecropping, plantation, sugar, machete, and Caribbean culture? Uh, absolutely. Um, it's all over both films, actually. Um, if you think about um, diasporically, um, Professor Alba, when he's dropping the rum on the ground, right, was uh, serving to the ancestors before you as, you as you do the work, something you see across Africa and also in parts of Yoruba traditions, Santeria traditions, right? Um, and then there are, of course, aspects of um, um, turning something that's a, a common tool into, into something of resistance. That's the story of the Haitian Revolution, right? So this cutlass that becomes the tool for common people is what is the, the mechanism for turning over, uh, you know, a huge uh, dominant world power. And um, definitely throughout the Caribbean, throughout the British West Indies, you see it globally with Mexican Americans, this tradition of what has become this lifelong, uh, this long two centuries worth um, process of people being exploited for their labor, being sent to the Americas to work on H2 visa programs, Caribbean importation schemes, you know, to come into work to replace what was first a slavery system here in the United States, and then um, to, repla to replace the fact that American workers also were being sort of pushed out of farm work as well, both black American workers and um, white workers as well, because all of them participated in that system as well. And now, this, you know, the story that we're being told is that Americans don't want to work in these fields, right? But that, if you, as you've told so well, um, 
it's a double-edged sword, right? Because they're not paying the kind of wages that people think are you know, responsible enough uh, for people to even take those wages. Uh, I wanted to ask each of you sort of, you know, how long was the process for you for filmmaking, for making your film? Um, how long did it take you to? Uh, it was about, it was 10 months. You know? okay. It was going down there, spending some time just fencing. You know, I, I went down and I was there for a few weeks, just just going to class every day with the professor and then eventually the, the rest of the team came. Um, my production partner, Keisha Ray with the spoon and director, John Kane. Um, and it was it was five of us. We came, we filmed, and then uh, we stuck around a little bit longer and then came back and went into edit. And I see. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I was also, it was interesting for me to really sort of think through the ways, when I first saw H2 Worker, you know, I couldn't help, and it it's drawing on something you also just mentioned, Joanne, in terms of, you know, these ideas that are starting, you know, that are percolating, that are just so pervasive right now in terms of deporting uh, the ice and the, the really sort of taking people and sort of extracting them and, and extracting them from families and all under the auspices of working, right, and trying to find and labor, but there's still at the root of this a sense of ex, uh, sort of exploitation. Uh, and really wanted to hear from any each of you sort of, I feel like even though this film is 28 years old at this point, that is still very, very timely uh, in, a dis, in a disturbing way. And then Joanne, you've brought to the for the fact that it even goes back further than that, when you just sort of think about, um, you know, sort of enslavement and Africans being dispersed throughout the diasporas in these ideas around geography and labor. So I would just love to hear about from each of you sort of your perspectives in terms of how these things connect with what's happening today. And uh, you touched on it a bit, Joanne, but I'd love to hear you know some even other thoughts that you might have with respect to that. Well, obviously in here, people were very much aware of the situation with the Dominican Republic a couple of years ago where they were doing massive deportations of Haitian people from the cane workers and they were um, from the cane workers field. Um, many Haitians who had been there for generations and had children, and they were retroactively um, rolling back the idea of citizenship so that even if you had been born there and had gone to school and grown up there, if you couldn't prove you know, that you had um, uh, Dominican citizenship, your children were gonna be sent back too. And doesn't that res resonate today, right? With DACA and what's going on right now. And then certainly, um, uh, uh, I think that Manley mentioned also that this um, this idea of um, people being sent around the, ca the Caribbean to do to cut sugar it happened in Cuba it happens in the Dominican Republic it happens in the United States and there are some common um, forces at play there and it's it's the United States has quite a bit to do with it you know first of all individually on our consumption of sugar you know the amount that we take in you know for our particular in our particular country and then also the trade agreements that are made with all these individual countries. Uh, I, we only have a few more minutes, and so Stephanie, I wanted to ask you sort of uh, a question in terms of, you mentioned your process in terms of the clandestine attempts that you all, or efforts that you all made. Um, what were some of the risks that the men made in terms of being on the camera, and um, you know, sort of, were there any assurances that you had to sort of provide or offer them for them to, or were they free and willing to just get on camera and, and express and talk about the conditions? Um, well, in the, it's a good, very good question. In the time that I was selling with. Um, Rose going from camp to camp. That's when I, I met and spoke with a lot of men. And um, I, at night, I would I would write the letters for them. That's how I ended up with the letters, because some of the men couldn't write. So I would um, do that and then ask for a copy of the letter, which is a bit tacky. But anyway, um, <laughs> that's how the letters were gathered. Um, we, the men, some of them, had just had enough and were really ready to go on camera and such. But for the most part, what, the way that we did it was all the interviews where you see the men, um, like Anthony in the field in his work clothes, we made a deal, like a plan. Okay, you'll come home from work on the bus and then you'll walk down the road and then we'll meet you down the road and we'll film the interview and then he'll go back so that no other worker 
could see him having done the interview. And then when we went inside the barracks, like if we were filming like just the, the wide sweeps of the barracks, even if there were men in there who I had done individual interviews with, I didn't acknowledge that we knew each other in any way. So that way, um, the, you know, but, but then of course, you know, the, the film came out. And so, um, but but that time the people who spoke on camera had told me like, cause I, we, you know, we explained this is probably gonna happen. You won't be able to come back anymore. And they said they didn't care. And, um, uh, and most of them, a lot of the men jumped the program also. So a lot of the men who um, you saw talking also jumped the program and just didn't go back and live in the States. But um, could I say something to the continuum? Is that okay? I'm sorry. Yeah. It, Please. It's just about yeah. what we spoke about. Um, yeah. yeah. So interestingly, um, so th this film hasn't screened in a very long time and I haven't seen it in a very long time and it's interesting to see how it plays now and pace our sense of timing and has changed. But so I did a lot of research to prepare for this talk and found out that interestingly enough, next week in Congress is a major discussion of um, the agriculture, the Guest Worker Agricultural Act, which wants to expand this program to 450,000 guest workers per year. Um, it's been put up by um, Senator Goodlatte and it's already gotten traction. It's passed through its first, and they want to, right, right now all the footage that we saw is archival footage. So the sugar industry uses mechanical harvesters. They only bring in 200 men to plant the seed cane every year. But, and, and when I filmed this film um, in like 1988, 89, there were a total of 20,000 H2 workers being brought into the country. They were working in sugar cane tobacco and the apples. Now, now there's 200,000 H2 workers. I'm just talking agricultural and they want to expand that now to 450,000 and expand it into meat processing, chicken processing, packaging, and other, and they want to expand it on this bill is um, to two years so that, so instead of only being allowed for a short time, they would be allowed to stay for two years. So that means after the first year, there would actually be 900,000 people. And this is, this is going through and just speaking about secrets and such, like, this is this is one of our country's secrets. I, I mean, I'm I'm actually even curious if like Floridians know that there is a guest worker program based. Yes. So, but it's interesting that that's happening at the same time that we're getting all this notification of you know sort of who belongs here, who doesn't belong here, who you know is being. Um, sort of forced out, chased out, and, and what jobs that they're ap apparently sort of taking. Um, but at the same time, there's this act that's being sort of uh, put before Congress that to pass to bring in workers under these very sort of um, dubious <laughs> working conditions, to say the least. Um, so there's no accident there. I will, uh, that really sort of begs us to, to, a, to open up to a lot of questions, but I want, before we open it up for a few, I wanted to ask you sort of uh, something that we had started talking about before the film started in terms of the ways in which, and each of you have touched upon like these interconnections, uh, sort of uh, cross-cultural relationships that are uh, apparent across the diaspora in the Caribbean. So how do you find sort of, and you mentioned as you, with your sort of being from Barbados, machetes were just a part of how you grew up. Are there other ways in which we can sort of see here in this community, um, sort of Caribbean cultures, African American cultures, co co intersecting? In what ways do we see sort of intersections taking place, even contemporary from a contemporary standpoint? Well, I think you know. I mean, it, it sounds probably sounds pretty. Um, you take it for granted, but I mean, the, the internet gives us so much possibility and, 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 and power to connect across lines which have historically, you know, there've been divisions, you know? Uh, and so I'm, for example, I, I run up, after making that film, I started a film festival uh, with my partners called Third Horizon. And through that, we've been able to bridge gaps. And I think that 
in this moment, we have to we have to do more reaching out. I think we have to reach out more to, you know, even even in a city like Miami, where public transportation is so terrible. <laughs> you know, we we have to we have to find ways to commune with our neighbors and realize that many. You know, the reason why I mentioned uh, Walter Rodney just now is because before his death, he really was of the understanding that. Um, the working class, even across racial and cultural lines, had were, were, were suffering under the same yoke, yeah. right? Uh, Fred Hampton, mm -hmm. Chicago, same thing. Black Panther, but same understanding. And so that's, I think that's an understanding, a, a message that we have to continue, you know, working to put out there. And that crosses all cultural sort of yeah. cultural boundaries, absolutely. So with that and with expanding understandings, we'll um, not take any questions. Okay. <laughs> so we're gonna. Um, we'd like to invite everyone to join us tomorrow at Little Haiti Cultural Center at four o'clock. Yes, we will continue. I guess we. Yes, that's a great segue. We will continue this conversation and these roots of memory um, through. Uh, furthering our Ju Juneteenth program at the Little Cultural Haiti, uh, Little Little Haiti, Li Cultural, Little Haiti Cultural, Center. Cultural Center at four o'clock tomorrow. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you, Joanne. Thank you, thank you Steph.